Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon again, and welcome back after uh, after our tea break. We seem to have lost some people, but that's uh, that's because all the other mini confs are uh, are great. Also, we hope to see many of many of them back for the uh, for the discussion later. What I'd like to do now is show you a number of things that my company OpenSTEM has been doing with kids in classrooms, and that's predominantly without using technology. And the reason for that is kind of contained in my earlier conversation, where I explained that it is actually very, very difficult to make technology work in classrooms. It sometimes works, which is great. And we've done, we've got some photos um, that I can send around later, um, little, little photo albums of kids building robots, doing the mechanics. They're doing soldering in year five, so that's like 10 and 11 year olds, uh, soldering in the classroom. Uh, so that's primary school kids doing soldering and, um, and doing programming. And um, some of that is visual, some of that is just straight, straight uh, coding, and, um, and also a little bit of, of Python and other, and other aspects to that. Um, we've done that, but that does rely on certain things working. Getting these little robots connected onto the school work network is a no-no. Um, having a laptop talk directly to another Wi-Fi network, which could be a robot, if it's on Wi-Fi, and these were, is a real problem. We need to get someone in the education, you know, the management system, to set those laptops to roaming profile, which means they're allowed to be on another Wi-Fi network. Otherwise, they just will not do it. So these simple things become really, really big things. So quite often, we just try to do something else entirely. And I'll give you a couple of examples, which I have hopefully got here. OK, I'll grab a couple of things. Um, grab that in a moment. OK, so one thing we've been working on, I already mentioned digital literacy and, you know, already the issue where um, kids in prep in year one are not actually able to hold a pencil and, and use it appropriately. There's other issues. We've, we've met kids in year four or five, so they're like about nine years old, who had trouble. They were perfectly literate, but they had trouble recognizing cursive print, so italics. And that's a real problem because not just in paper, in, in printed matter do you see that, but you see it on, online all the time. They actually had trouble reading that. Now, I'm, I'm not an educational psychologist, but the way that works for me is, okay, their neural net was trained for straight letters. It hadn't picked up the cursive, therefore the neural net didn't contain that aspect of the pattern recognition. Might be simplified, but I'm pretty sure it's not incorrect. So just to give you an idea of what we do, you've seen the digital tech curriculum. It doesn't talk about cursive. However, somewhere in the English curriculum is get familiar with the letters of the alphabet. And since people have to become digitally literate, how about we do something like this? Instead of just A for Apple, use uppercase and lowercase, and digits, of course, of different letters. And there are others. Well, this is an eight, which is, of course, a bad example. But in there somewhere is, here we go, there's an A. And you can see the, a number of different fonts were picked. So there's a, there's a sans serif, there's a serif font. Um, that is the font that um, Open, OpenStem also uses. It's a mix of different, different fonts. It's actually called Averia. It's one of the Google fonts. Um, that one is cursive, like handwriting, and there's a couple of others, and that one is a really quirky computer font, just to get things out of the ordinary. So when, when prep-age kids get used to the alphabet, this might be one of the resources they could use. And it seems really simple, but it becomes really important because they can, they can sort, for instance, grab all uppercase letters together, grab all lowercase letters, grab all the letters that are written like that. You get the sorting games, which is, again, an important skill, or grouping games, really. It's an important skill. But again, while doing English and literacy, they're actually also working on the digital literacy, which means their ability to actually recognize the right characters on the screen, which is not an optional extra. Similarly, we might get them to play with things like touch paint. Touch paint is fabulous because it's actually been engineered, possibly from the outset, 
to work really well for tiny little kids. It can take over the entire screen and not have little bars doing other things. So even if you click in the wrong place, it's only touch paint that operates. And you can actually disable print buttons, you can disable save buttons, and that's all in the management interface. You can do it any way you like. It runs on Windows, it runs on Macs, it runs on Linux. It even runs on tablets. And that's fabulous. And the reason we use that is it's free, so it doesn't cost a, uh, a school anything extra. It's easy to install. Yes, it may need one of those admins at the school or the contractors to, to install it. Um, but then it allows the kids, while they're drawing and having fun, to acquire more mouse skills. Because again, the ability from your hand, while you're looking at something else, to control what's going on on the screen is actually not entirely natural. It's an acquired skill. So it needs to be practiced. And Tux Paint is one of those tools that actually works rather well. Okay, so that's just another example. Um, I'd like to briefly visit that challenge that I set you earlier in the day. Who actually did this challenge? Yeah? You wrote some code? Yeah. Um, can you show me the code? I, I'm, a, I'm a programmer, so I can read the code. Stay put, camera, I'll be back. I don't know. Ah, you suffer from the same mouse problem. This one. Will that work? I think that'll work. Mm. Okay. Yes, that will work for quirky reasons. But yes, it will work. Yeah, I think you're good. That's good. No, I think that's correct. The, the, the plus ones, I'm not entirely certain about, but... Oh, yes, yes, yes. No, that, that's, that's right. Okay, look. Typos and, 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 and coding bugs aside, you've got the logic right. That already brings up an interesting thing. So, okay, one of our audience has actually solved, solved the problem. I've looked at the code and I know it's correct. You don't need to run it because I can tell as a programmer that you've got the right idea. I don't actually care whether the program runs or not. Because I'm a programmer, I recognize that you've got the right idea. There's a million ways of doing this problem, but I know you've got the right idea. A teacher confronted with this is pretty much at sea because they're not comfortable programming. They haven't done it for years. They don't have the pattern recognition skills to, to do this particular exercise. The reason I mention this, uh, this thing now is it's actually a computer version of a kiddie game called FizzBuzz. You sit around in a circle, the first person says one, the second person says two, the third person says fizz, the fourth person says four, the fifth person says bar, and so on. If you do that in a computer program, you get this. Here's the interesting thing. I saw you did the correct thing because rather than just printing bar at five, you were actually appending the string that may already be there. You, you emptied the string, then you, add, then you replaced it with, with foo if, if three, and you appended the bar. So for 15, you'd get foo and bar, which is the correct way of going about it. Um, so you had, had an actual good and, and functional implementation. Again, there's different ways of doing it. Interestingly, there's double digit percentage of actual programmers out there, these are IT graduates, or at least people who work out in IT field as programmers, who cannot do this. Which means that there's a problem there in the programming. What has gone wrong in their training or in their learning of problem solving and, and pattern recognition and, and, and that stepwise thinking, you know, the computational thinking, that they can't actually solve this problem. I think that's a real issue that we need to consider that we're sending people out in the real world who are not actually capable to solve that, that kind of thing. Um, I tossed this at some of the kids starting with programming, in this case it was Python, um, started with programming in, I think it was a year six, and one solved it, the whole thing, conceptually, within two minutes. And he hadn't done Python before. Then I gave him the basic, you know, I was talking about the basic principles of, of Python, you know, how to, do, how to do a loop. Yes, I do loops early, and uh, because I think they're really important, and how to print something, and I had to show separately for this test the modulo operation to, to you know, check the visibility. Um, it took them another five or 10 minutes to get through the, you know, the syntax of, 
of Python and execution functional program, but he did. Now, he's very good at maths, that, per, that, that kid. But if, a, if an 11-year-old can solve it and a graduate IT person in double digit percentages doesn't, we have a problem. So that thinking is really, really important. Okay? Now, I'll, I'll run you through a number of other, other thingies. Um, and we are fairly, really? Okay. Well, that's gone well then. That's very exciting. Technically, these are slides. There's images on there, and they're not being shown. That's okay. We have a plan B. Bear with me. I will need to slide each one in individually. Um, so, let's get them right. Yes, this slows things down considerably, obviously. Okay. And this is mainly to give you an idea of what we're doing. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what I will do is actually toss something around. Can I, can I have a volunteer who will walk around? Skull goes away. Ah, thank you. Give everybody one of these red bags. I would li like you to make sure that you actually keep all the bits that are in there together so we can get them back and together in the bag. Okay, so. This set of trickery, yes, they will rattle on the table, and that's excellently fine. Um, it's called Diced Maths. Just a name I came up with. Um, what the kids will do in groups, you can do it alone. Some kids work really well on their own. Some kids work well in a little cluster of two. And other kids like to have five or six friends around. That just differs. You can't really say you need to do it in groups of so many. Okay? Um, and yes, some, some are not entirely uniform colors. They're, um, they're just assembled over time, and I use them for my demo, uh, demo classes. Um, using these dice, we play different activities, exercises, games, whatever you want to, uh, to call it. And um, so this is one of the ones, which is really very early. So we throw, roll a die, and let's say they're on position seven. They roll a, they roll a five. So 7 plus 5 equals, and I need to move along on the snake. It's nothing complicated. There's nothing special about it. Everybody has one? Or, yeah, I'm pretty sure we ran out. But, you know, if you've had a little look, get it together and pass it to someone else. Who hasn't got a set now? Every, yeah, one? Only one? Oh, I might have an extra one in the top of my bag. Hang on. No, I've got one more bag. That's okay. I can do that. Okay, Cherie, can you grab this one and pass it on? If there's only one missing, I can fix that. It'll come back, I'm sure. That's okay. All right, so now I don't have my own set, but <laughs> since you all have it in your hands, I'll, 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 grab, one, I'll grab one set here. Uh, here. Ah, I'll grab these. Okay, so what's in the little bag is a set of dice. Now, first of all, there's a regular D6, six-sided die, in a set of dots, instead of dots, it has numbers on it. So that's not particularly interesting. But then we have all these others. And they go all the way up to something called a D60 there. So it's a 60-sided die, and it goes all the way from 1 to 60. Why might we need that? Well, I can combine it with a D24. I roll it, and I actually have a nice clock game. I have a 24-hour clock in my hand, random number generator. So kids can roll these dice and play a game where they need to convert the resulting time into A and PM notation. Or roll the die, roll these two dice, write down the result, then roll them again, and then calculate the difference in minutes or hours and minutes between the two numbers. Make sense? Now, why am I doing things like this? Um, there's other games. Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple of others, and yes, there are many more, many more dice. There's a, there's a D4, which looks a bit like a pyramid. There's a D8, which is like a pyramid stuck with a pyramid upside down. Um, there's a D10, which counts from 0 to 9. There's also different D10s, which you may or may not have in your bag, which goes from 1 to 10. Then there's a D12 a D20 in some of them, and a D30 in some of them. And then there's 
I call it a D percent. It goes 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, and so on. If we combine this one with the D10 and roll them together, they're actually D100. Okay, so what I've just rolled is 40 and 9, so 49. Okay, so these two together, I don't need the die that is 100 sides. I've got a D100 here. Okay. Um, I'll show you another example. That one I need to wipe out and show you, let's say, Times Square is a good little example for starters. Here you go. Okay, so one of the early things that kids start to do when, when dealing with multiplication tables is, well, learning what that looks like. What do these tables look like? Now, for kids, visual, touching things is important. So the dice are awesome because they're not regular dice. Everybody loves these dice, right? Who is really upset by these dice? Yeah? No one. Yeah? Who really likes, you know, you have it in your hand? Yeah, you can play with it. Yeah, I see some nods and happiness. So, you know, it's nice to have a look at, play with, and you actually want to do something with it. Yeah? So that's what, how the kids feel. And um, so this particular activity is about pattern recognition. Because kids like to touch stuff, but they're also very visual. So if you start rolling, well, you roll a die. You, let's say you roll three. And then you start finding all the multiples of three. And the other thing I have in the bag is little counters. They're not actually counters, they're actually mini buttons. The little buttons with the holes in them. They're much easier to, to find than proper counters. So, yes. Um, so I've got bags and bags of them. Normally in the classroom sets, each of these bags has uh, about 15 to 20 of these counters built, built in, and they're differently colored. So they lay out the buttons on the multiples of three. Out comes a pattern. It doesn't do anything particular, but it does sink in. And then the fives make a different pattern, the fours make a different pattern. The nine makes a nice pattern, you know, nine, 18, 27, it goes backwards as a, in a bit of a, bit of a diagonal line. Um, and that is actually really beneficial because learning times tables is utterly boring. This makes it unboring. Now, it's still regarded, this is still purely mathematics, but it makes it interesting without going online. You don't need to have a web app to make this work. The reason for using dice is that if we were to do some of these activities with worksheets, you need to pre-calculate lots of things. That's not beneficial. We have a beautiful random number, number generator with these dice. So that's what we're using. Um, so later on, with some of the multiplications, you could get to this. Now again, this one is a bit simply and stupid, but it still works. You grab a D10 and a D12, you roll them, and you multiply one with the other. Amazingly, kids actually like to do this. Don't ask me why, I just take it as a fact. I was quite impressed that even this one, which looks utterly boring, is actually a liked game. In fact, we now have feedback from a class where the kids were kind of assigned, okay, you two kids go on the computer and you have some time on one of the online mathematics activities. They came away from the com and I have I've seen those things to actually pretty, you know, colorful, engaging, interesting games online. They came away from that computer, went up to the teacher and say, please miss, can we, are we allowed to play with the dice, do one of the dice activities instead? And they said, sure, here you go. And I think, yes, I won. That wasn't really the objective to win in that way, but yes, we did. Apparently, playing in the real world with a couple of dice on a desktop with a piece of paper that is somewhat colored can be more cool for primary school kids. This is year four, five, and six primary school, just regular kids. Um, apparently, that can actually be just as cool or more cool than an online game. So in terms of making things engaging for students, we don't need to make it flashy and it doesn't need to be an iPad app. Does that make sense? And I thought that was an interesting, you know, for that, for that purpose, I think it's a victory. Now, you might wonder, how, does, how do things get more complicated? This one doesn't involve dice necessarily, and I need to, oh, I need to play that game again. <sighs> Fit the whole page. Just gives you an idea. This one, you would, you would grab a grid, you make a drawing on it, 
and then you verbally convey those coordinates to another person and they need to end up with the same drawing. Or not, and you can have a laugh about it. Yeah? You're already sniggering. That's exactly it. So it's hilarious. It's good fun. But at the same time, they're learning about the Cartesian plane. Yeah? It's that straightforward. It is that simple. And it makes maths fun without pretending it's not maths. So, yes, I've kind of gamified it. It's one of those words. I've kind of gamified it, but not covertly. I haven't tried to invent a game that doesn't look like maths. Kids are okay with that, and I've actually tried this. I've played with classes not telling them it's maths early on when it wasn't called Dice Maths and so on, and played games with them. And I've had other classes where I did tell them. It makes quite a lot of a difference. It really doesn't matter. They don't mind being told actually what it is. They're not opposed to maths. They would just prefer it was more interesting. Because one of the things that gets taught often is something called the mad minute. It's one sheet. It seems to be kind of standardized, and it has a x times y equals x times y <laughs> equals and all of those. It's one set, and they come back every week, and the idea is how many can you solve within a minute. So some people, try, uh, their brain starts memorizing the answers. Other people just struggle every week. I don't know if anybody gets anything out of it. The point is, if they play the same game with the dice, they probably retain more. Um, so let's raise the stakes a bit. And again, he'll be one, this will be one that doesn't do um, dice as such, but does make the kids think about stuff. So, prime numbers. Somewhere, when was it? 276 BC. Um, or a little bit later, of course, because he needed to be born first. Um, Eratosthenes in Greece worked out a prime sheave. And it's one of the early ones, obviously. But again, you can play with the... Um, you can do it with counters, but it works better if you were to copy the sheet or copy it out yourself on, a, on such grid paper and color in. So you first color in the 2, the 4, the 6, the 8, and so on. And then you grab a different color, and you color in the 3, and the, and the... Well, you can't color in the 6, because it was already colored in by the 2. But what one teacher did is say, don't color in the whole square, draw a line on the right-hand side. And the next one you do, draw a line in a different color on the left-hand side, and slowly you work your way in if there's multiples. So for the 6, you can then see visually, and I really like that idea, you can see visual that it's divisible by 2 and by 3. It's actually a different type of number. And there are some numbers that don't ever get colored in. Guess what? Those are the prime numbers. And now you've learned a whole lot of things. At the same time, they're doing multiplication tables. They're working out for which, um, for which multiplication tables there's overlap with other multiplication tables, like the fizz buzz. You know, at 15, you hit both the 3 and the 5. It's interesting. It's actually fun. They get to do coloring in. It's a total score for kids. And you're thinking, prime sheave or Eratosthenes, what are we talking about? I just call it that because that's what it is. I'm not going to make up another name for it. It works. They're not scared by it. And they learn about prime numbers. And that is just part of the mathematics curriculum, so I'm not doing anything special. Now, at some point, kids need to learn about 3D shapes. So um, transformation, rotation, that kind of thing. Who here knows Tetris? Yes, everybody does. OK. Tetris are just four blocks. And the Tetris game involves all blocks, um, all permutations of those four. And you're the one rotating and mirroring. But it's essentially the same thing. This is the same thing with five blocks. There's a few more. There's a total of, let me think, yeah, there, 12. There's a total of 12. So the first challenge for the kid is, on your own grid paper, in your own workbook, or in a little group maybe, Work out all the different permutations. The chances of that going right the first time are about nil, but that's not the point. It's the effort and the, the exercise that is really important. They'll probably get duplications in rotation or mirroring, and the teacher from that can tell what that child might be struggling with, or just needs a bit more practice. In any case, it's a good fun game. As a game here, it's non-judgmental. There's no right answer. But in the end, with mistakes made, they will end up with 12 unique pentominoes. Then they cut them out, and then it becomes really interesting. They try to make it as a puzzle into this shape. It fits exactly. The good thing is there's quite a few po possibilities for that one. There's quite a few possibilities for that one. As the text explains, 
In a three by 20 grid, there's only two solutions. So that one is a bit finicky. <laughs> but some kids might be ready for that. Others will just ignore it and don't worry about it. See what I mean? So, you know, I make things quite complicated. Now, who here is familiar with the letters and numbers game that was played on SBS some years ago? Nobody? Let's have a look and let's actually play it. Um, I should finish up soon too. Let's see, where is it? Number reach. Yes. It's actually a game from, I'll just load this one. Um, come on. Um, it's actually a game from France. Whoops, it loaded in the wrong direction. There. Um, it's actually a game invented in France in the 1960s. It didn't quite go full screen. Hang on a moment. Bear with me. At some point it will say blip. No, it didn't say blip. Where did it go now? It went away. Okay, that wasn't the one then. Come on. Okay, there we go. Now I just need to stick it full screen. It's a bit tricky, but when those slides don't work, the other slides didn't work. I had them all lined up so I could just show you. What I've done here is with slight tweaks, the numbers game from letters and numbers which was originally called De Cifre et de Lettres in France, and it's called Cyphers and Letters in the Netherlands, and it's called Countdown in the UK, and has run for many, many decades. It's a very popular game. Um, I've converted that into a dice game. So what you do is you grab a D6 and you roll it, and from that you translate it into two numbers. For instance, if you roll a 3, you translate it into 25 and 100. Okay, you put 25 there, 100 there. You don't need to lay it out like this, but this is just an example. Um, I have often the, the printouts that the teachers can do. They can print these out in color. They're just PDFs. That's how they're sold um, or given, whichever the, the context is. Um, they're laminated, and once they're laminated, you can actually draw on them and wipe them out again. But quite often, the kids are quite comfortable having this as a sheet next to them as a template, and then they write in a workbook on a little whiteboard or a tablet or, you know, whatever works. So they write down those numbers, and then they need four, small four numbers. So they roll the D10. If it's a 1 to 10 D10, they just roll it four times. If it's a 0 to 9, the 0 means a 10. Okay, we need a number from 1 to 10. If there's more than two of the same, you need to re-roll. It's fairly straightforward. Yeah, you can't have more than two twos in there. That's just a basic rule. Then we work out a target number here. We need to roll a D10 and a D100 and stick them together with a bit of a rule set so you end up, I think it's from 100 to no, one, no, well, maybe this is the newest thing, 101 from, to 999. The objective is using basic addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, division, and you're only allowed to use integers and you're not allowed at any point to go either into fractions or negative numbers to end up from those numbers there. You don't have to use all the numbers. Yeah? We can maybe play this afterwards or in a break or, or whatever. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, I've, I thought, well, this might be a bit hard for year fives and sixes, even though they technically have all the skills available if they've practiced them enough. And it doesn't have to be fast. I'll simplify this. So I'll make it a target for 99. Leave one of these digits off um, and remove one of those. Yeah? And that also works out quite nicely. The kids quickly decided that that was boring, they liked the extra challenge, and they just played a regular game. Now, remember, this game was designed for adults. In Britain, decades ago, there have already been teenage champions, but now we're talking primary school kids, and apparently this is not a problem. What this does is practice all of Bondas, you know, the um, you know, um, division and multiplication before addition and subtraction and all those rules, um, it's problem solving, approximation comes into play, because it's actually quite possible that you can't reach this number exactly. The rule is, as it says there, try and get as close as possible. Now some kids, the nitpicky ones, get really frustrated about that one initially. That's the feedback we get when we ask, because they really want to get there. Well, it's sometimes not possible, but that's the real world. Why would I protect them from that kind of experience in the real world? Sometimes it's not possible to reach the exact goal, but you get really close, and that's cool too. And even if they are not able to get there, 
even if the number is reachable with that, with maybe our more experienced mathematical knowledge, that's okay too, because they've done all the problem solving, they've practiced all those multiplication skills, the bond dash skills, um, approximation skills, and so on. They've done all the things required. So is the end result a correct answer? No, because the journey was actually what we wanted to achieve. And that's why these kids love that. This is just tracking back and discussing with the teachers and seeing what's actually going on. So, and the interesting thing is it seems like a bit of a complex game, but there's so much wrapped up in there that is just entirely normal for the kids at that time. The cool thing is they actually do get better at the mathematics. They get better at the, better at the mental math. Sometimes it's played with an entire class on a whiteboard and sometimes it's just played in little groups on a piece of paper. And they actually want to play this. Now this is new. Can we please do mathematics more? The chief complaint to me was earlier on, we want to do more of this in class. Sorry, I can't help that. There's a limited amount of time and it's up to your teacher to go ask them. Yeah, but that you know, was it, is potentially achievable and they could take this stuff home too. Um, by the way, the, the actual dice sets, um, they're a bit of an assembly from, from different things. I think I sell them for about $15. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not expensive to have five or six, six of these sets in a classroom. That's entirely achievable. We're not talking hundreds of dollars. And each of these costs a couple of dollars if, if you were to buy them separately without other, other packaged arrangements. So I'm not trying to make this expensive and make a lot of money. I'm trying to actually get things out there and, and improve the world for, for more people out there and more, more kids actually being excited about being in school rather than bored and dangerous. Of uh, course, bored kids are the worst. Can't have bored kids. That's really not a good thing. <laughs> and they don't need to be. And it's, it's really important that kids actually learn and, and do the things they need to do and, and want to do. Um, so, yeah, that, that's examples there. Um, any others I have here? Let me do a quick check. Well, I think we're about good with that. We're also about out of time with that one. Um, I've got another couple of examples here, which, which you can have a look at. Again, there, there's, there's slides. I've played with Rubik's Cubes in classrooms. Um, while kids like playing with them, there is this divide between some kids who are actually interested in how to solve them and other kids really don't care. And I'm pretty sure that's the same in this, this room. Who here is able to solve the basic Rubik's Cube? Hmm? Could you could in primary school. Okay, same, and I actually maintained this practice. One, two, three, and I could in primary school. Okay, so that's not that many. How many of you have played with them? Yeah, okay. How many of you really don't give a toss one way or the other? Yeah, very perfectly fine. But you're perfectly normal human beings. It just doesn't appeal to you. So... Actually, Rubik's, the, the, the company or whoever runs that now, um, they, they have classroom sets. Unfortunately, I don't think that's a winner because you will never get an entire classroom that actually is engaged with this. These things, I managed to actually engage the entire classroom. So while I have a number of different Rubik's cubes there, even the really weird ones, and I'll show a couple because I think they're rather cool. Um, yeah, I need to show this one as well. So you can get things like this. It's actually nothing special. It just is a bit mind-bending. When it's in proper shape, it is a normal cube. It's just that the center is slightly offset, so it looks like a futuristic, wonky, freakazoid cube. Um, instead of colors, you need to think shapes. And then it works out, okay, it's actually no different from the regular cube. Similarly, this apple, also neatly stuffed up, is the same again, except it has, you know, it has those corners, the edges, it's funky again. I like it. So I enjoy those. I'm much slower at solving them. Yes, we can solve them. They, they do move. Um, and yes, I can fix them, but I'm fairly slow at them. I can do a regular cube in about a minute 40. So I'm not a speed cuber, but I can solve them fairly consistently and fairly fast. But um, yeah, anyway, it's fun for some people and I like them. And I thought, well, let's try that with classrooms. Maybe I can do projects with that. Doesn't work. Um, I'll give you a final thing, something orange. Um, different subject, not, uh, not maths. That is a print of a scan of Homo erectus. Um, she's 1.8 million years old, found in East Africa. If you look up Homo erectus on Wikipedia, 
you will find that exact skull, as in the photo of that. Um, it's printed at half size. Okay, so half size in this direction, so it's one eighth the volume, makes it easy to, to grab. We also haven't, it, it's 3D printed. It's not printed in bone color because that freaks people out. Um, it, it would freak me out. I don't deal well with that. As I said, my wife is an archaeologist. She's cool with dead things, um, as long as they don't have the gooby bits, um, the icky bits or yucky bits, as she calls them. Um, but you know, having them in orange or red and blue works really well. Um, we do use those in classrooms. The, um, and it's actually quite a scalable idea to use these in classrooms. Most of these skulls are actually available online if you look carefully enough. The licensing is not always perfect, but it's often something like Creative Commons attribution. Um, in some cases, there's, there's tricks to the licensing, which means that we can't put them on our website, but we can direct you to where they are. And you sometimes need to log in and ask for permission or whatever. It's a bit tricky. But many high schools, at least, have 3D printers. How about they use them to print stuff like this? and use them in science and, 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 in this case, history, maybe classrooms as well. Just one extra idea, you know, how to make, uh, make life more interesting. Um, if you were to buy this, there's a company called Bones Clones. It costs about $200 per skull. We have more than 10 of these at home, different ones. So we have thousands of dollars worth of skulls. No, we don't. This thing costs less than 50 cents to make. Yeah? And many schools already have a 3D printer. Who here has a 3D printer at home? Anyone? One? Not a symbol. Fair enough. That's the way. OK, right. Fair enough. You don't have a printer to put it together yet. But yes, in any case, there's plenty of them around. And um, it's entirely feasible. So anyway, just a, just a little idea on the side. I'll, I'll finish up there. Um, any, any quick questions about the dice and, and what, we're, what we're doing with it? That was actually the main gist of the idea. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I can imagine that's a very accessible uh, way of creating science stuff for any school. Mm -hmm. So is there a set of things that are like a preset of that are ready for a school and you just download and get it printed and just put it in class instead of trying to find things online? In, in what context? What, what subject uh, area? Example, if, yeah. If Yep. And they want to uh, kind of put pretty printed objects in the science lab. Is there a piece of all the things ready to go? OK, understood. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yep. Um, so your question is, is there other services available where a remote school that doesn't have a 3D printer, please correct me when I'm going wrong on, on the question. Just, just finding those models. Yeah, finding the models online and so on. OK. We try to list the references to those models on our website. Because of the licensing, we are not actually able to print and send that off. Um, any, at any point, because of the exact licensing, and we need to comply with that, obviously, um, the moment we were to charge even for things like the posting, we are on the wrong side of the licensing agreement. So it gets complicated. We could, they, can they could print it themselves, and the information is available. The, yes, the problem is that depending on your printer, your settings may need to be slightly tweaked and so on. And that comes into another topic then again. I mean, maybe this was a bit out of scope. The, the, the problem becomes the familiarity of the people with the actual technology of the 3D printer. Often that is not sufficiently developed. 3D printers are not like inkjet printers and laser printers. It doesn't belong in that family. It's actually a workshop tool like a lathe. And a lathe you can you know, safely work with but it takes a while to get used to the intricacies of how it works, and then you need how to tune it and maintain it. That is not what's being done with 3D printers at the moment. They're like a consumer product, but they're not. So, you know, many schools have 3D printers, but many also don't use them for that exact reason. They're not exactly calibrated, don't quite do the right thing, and they're just abandoned because the teachers don't have time. It goes back to the time factor. But, yes, it, it will improve, of course, and then that's, that's how things develop. Okay, one more question, or shall we go on to the discussion, which I think we are due for. Cool. Thank you. I'll fill that one. <laughs>